peace to you who are watching today. I am Reverend Dr. Paul Siaki, and it's really a pleasure to be with you and to be able to give this lecture. And um, just in, in way of introduction, I am a New Zealand um, citizen as well as an American citizen. And um, I, my, my last name sounds Japanese, but uh, it's actually of Samoan descent. My father, my grandfather was the brother of the king of Samoa. And so, um, but he ran away with somebody else from a different island. So he got banished to that island and uh, um, they gave him the name Siakimotu, which means to leave a nation or to leave an island. And so my father, who was the eldest of the eldest, had that reduced to Siaki. And um, so he has the, the reigning prince of it all. And I am the next in line. If a bunch of people died, I'd be the king of Samoa. Anyway, that's to let you know. And then I... Um, I have lived in Southeast Asia for 15 years. I was in the United States for another 15 years. I got my PhD there in missiology, which is the study and the theology of mission, basically, and studied in Israel, which um, eventually led me. I, I just I was in a Baptist church in an Anglican, I mean not Anglican, uh, in evangelical churches as I was growing up, and. Um, I had never met an Anglican in my life, and while I was in Israel, I uh, did research into all the different denominations that were available, and um, I arrived at Anglicanism, which I thought God was joking with me. So um, I'd never met an Anglican, never been to an Anglican service, and there is a reason for being an Anglican, but that's for another lecture, if Eben ever, Father Eben ever invites me back. So um, today, uh, what I'd like to be talking about with you is what does the, the future church look like? What is, what is going to be happening? Um, at the University of Pretoria, at the Center for Contextual Ministry, I will be doing, now it's been postponed till next year, but I will be doing a lecture on fostering socio-ecclesial imaginaries which I uh, happen to mention to Father Eben, and basically it means future church. It's just the academics like to make it sound all fancy. Um, but in terms of talking about ecclesiology, which we will touch upon today, ecclesiology is the study of the context of the situation where the gospel is and the traditions and marks of church and mission down through the ages. Okay, so I want you to think right now, how has lockdown changed your paradigm of church? How has that caused you to think differently about church? And I want to ask another question. It's kind of a chicken or egg question. And which came first, God's mission or the church? Go ahead and think about that. I'll wait. I don't have a watch on. So... If you said the church, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. Uh, the mission of God came first. So I want to talk about something called the Miseo Dei, and that is Latin for basically the mission of God. And mission flows from the very character of God himself. And mission is not primarily an activity of the church, but an activity and an attribute of of God. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before. I don't know if you've ever given any time or energy thinking about this and how it relates to you. But God's purposes are happening in this world. And so how, what does that mean to you? What does God's mission mean to you? And mission is primarily an activity uh, that God isn't engaged with um, down through the centuries, all the way since Genesis, the, the beginning when God came walking in the, in the garden and he said, where are you? And he has been saying, where are you to mankind ever since? So the mission of God is active in this world and it is an attribute of God. And to say that God is more missionary than we are 
is a true statement and quite often unfortunately we are not very missional. So we are first and foremost a product of the mission of God and then we are the agents for that mission in the world. All right, I want you to think about that. We are agents for that mission. We have been given an assignment and we just need to step into it. And the church has always been a community called together to be equipped to go back out and engage in what God is doing in the world. I love a quote by theologian uh, Emil Brunner. And he says, the church exists by mission as fire exists by burning. So again, think about that. How does that challenge your paradigm or thoughts about church? Uh, have you actually thought about the fact that church should be um, mission-oriented and really propelled along by mission? And if you think about it, it is the key thing in terms of the church itself. I mean, if you think about it, in AD 100, there were only about 25,000 Christians. But by AD 313, um, when Constantine uh, legalized the church, there were over upwards of 20 million Christians. So how could something like that happen? I mean, Christianity was an illegal religion. They had no church buildings to meet in. They didn't have the scriptures that we have today. They didn't have institutions, no denominations or seminaries for training, no advertising or marketing schemes. And in fact, they actually made it very difficult to join the church. They had a long initiation process before someone was allowed to come into the church. So it's amazing to think, how, does, how did that church, how did Christianity survive? Well, it was the, the, the continuation and the involvement in the mission of God. It was God moving forward His mission, and the church grew in that way. Christianity grew in that way. I'm going to give you some quotes about mission that you can decipher for yourself as possibly true or false. And the first one is, it is not the church of God that has a mission in the world, but the God of mission who has a church in the world. All right, did you get that? It's not the church of God that has a mission in the world. So it's not the church doing things that, that says, oh, okay, we're going to do this outreach. We, we're gonna, we've got this that we want to do. But it is the God of mission who happens to have a church that is helping out in that mission. Okay, another one. Mission is finding out what God is doing and joining in. And perhaps you've heard that one. And what that is, is it's basically just showing, again, God is moving. And so, where is He at work? He's going to be moving, whether we're part of it or not. So, we need to ask ourselves, where is He at work and join in with Him? This one, God works only in and through His chosen people, the church. Well, I hope you realize that that is false. Because God is at work, no matter, no matter what. He has used... Um, evil kings, as you know from Scripture, and emperors like uh, Cyrus and a number of people, and there are those who believe that God is using Trump in some way. Okay, no, don't let, don't get me going. Um, but there's there's a number of of things where we see God already happening. When um, it escapes me now, Philip went to to see the eunuch was already reading the scriptures. So God is at work. Let's find out where, where he's at work and join with him. Mission is primarily about growing the church. Again, we're thinking that the end goal of what we're doing is for the church. But the end goal is, again, to advance the kingdom of God, to think about the reign and the kingdom of God here on earth and how we advance the mission of God. And then this one, mission is something which happens in other parts of the world. And that has for a long time been a mindset of established churches. And they think, well, it's somewhere else. It's away from us. And I want you to be thinking that, no, there are so many um, areas where we need to be working. When, when you think about the Great Commission from Matthew 28, 
Um, the word when he says to go and make disciples of all nations, that Greek word is ta ethne. Uh, and ta ethne, we get ethne, which uh, gives us the word ethnic, ethnicity. So it's talking about every cultural group we need to be reaching, and that includes those around us. So, and then this one, um, which is one of my favorite, the church is by nature missionary to the extent that if it ceases to be missionary, it has not just failed in one of its tasks, it has ceased to be church. Did you get all that? But basically, missionary in nature, and if it is not, it has ceased to be church. Um, that comes from J. Andrew Kirk, but uh, David Bosch of South Africa has a very similar quote. Again, mission is not new, and it is not an extra, okay? It is a key principle of what the church was founded on and, and should be uh, emphasizing and is built upon and is moving forward uh, in this world. You know, I'll skip that. You know, um, there was a time when Christendom was at, when the church, during Christendom times in Europe especially, um, when church was at the center of our society. And it re a society tended to revolve around what happened in the church. And the church, uh, I'd like you to imagine this, the church was like in a valley between two mountains. And everything ran down into the church, okay? Everything, baptism, education, marriage, festivals, Sunday, sickness, bereavement, death. And the mission task during that time was to take people from the the front door to the baptistry to the communion table and altar and then eventually they'd be equipped and they'd go out into the world so that used to be what the church was used to and so there's a mentality sometimes these days where people think oh the church is still like that everybody should be coming down towards the church rolling towards the church but the truth is that the church is actually now one of many institutions and attractions that are on the side of the hill as people are rolling down. And the church has to do whatever it can to reach out to those people who are going down the hill because they're, they're, they're going to a different valley completely. So the church on that side needs to, as part of its mission, say, how do we get people here and make them disciples and bring them into the church, or make a church wherever they happen to be. Okay, so I've been talking about the Maseo Day, and I want to quickly, this might seem like a detour, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit about culture, okay? And this is an important thing to think about when we think about mission or the future of where the church is going. I'm going to ask you another question. Why do you think culture works? Okay, I'd ask Father Eben back there, but you know, he's He's kind of, his eyes are closing a little bit. But um, if you, have, uh, you've probably never thought, culture? Culture just works, right? Well, why does culture work? Culture works because it's the only thing we've ever been exposed to when we were growing up, right? It, it works because there's a stickability about the things that you had to do when you were growing up. Like if you... When you came to uh, have a meal, it's not like you said to your parents, oh, I'd rather use chopsticks. And they said, oh, that's fine. Use your hands, that's fine. You don't want to wear clothes outside? Perfectly good. None of that happened. Everything was set in place. So that's how strong culture is. And one of the things, uh, Dr. Lloyd Quast from my university says, culture is like, if you can try and imagine, an onion, okay? And at the very core of it, you've heard of this, it's worldview. And our worldview is so key to what happens. Our worldview uh, impacts the beliefs that are next, the values, and then eventually our behaviors or artifacts or forms that we have. The majority of the world, non-Christian, let me say, look at everything starting from the outside of the onion going in. They look at the behavior, they look at the forms, they look at the outside first before they start going, if they ever start going, to values, beliefs, and worldview. Now, worldview for Christians 
we are different. We start from the inside going out because our worldview informs our beliefs, our values, our behavior. Right? I know you're all nodding your head with me because that makes a difference for us. So worldview is so key and worldview gives us our identity. What is real? What really, what happens to us? What do we believe in? How do we see ourselves? The, the, it answers the ultimate questions, the universe, um, God, uh, even so much as the spiritual and the material world. I mean, if you get sick, is it because you got germs or is it because someone put a curse on you? So again, we have our worldview determines how we think about these things. And so it, it, it gives us this meta narrative over everything. And we need to keep thinking to ourselves, then how important is worldview? How does it, how does it impact the way I see the world and what I'm willing to see? and how I see my church, because there is a Christian blind spot for all of us when it comes to our churches and how we were raised. We tend to think, like culture, this is the only way you do it, and this has to be the right way. So we'll, we'll need to think, how does that fit in to God's mission in this world? I wish I could show you, and actually it might come up on the screen now, a South-oriented map. Think about it. Think if you were looking at a map that was turned upside down, right? You would think it was wrong. But actually, north-oriented maps are completely arbitrary. When the first um, pictures from space was sent to NASA, they came in south-oriented. But NASA made a decision that people would be confused, so they flipped it and made it north-oriented, which means every map since then has been north-oriented. But it's arbitrary. But what it, what it, what it um, goes to the heart of is that it, it comes up with this dichotomy that north is better than south, that north is more prosperous, that north has better things, all, all this. And, it, and it's amazing how that plays into our worldview and what we are doing. So what is key for us is we need to address the gospel to the core, the worldview of where people are. So as we go forward, how do we address the worldview, the core, the gospel, addressing the changes of where people really are when we think about where the church is going to be going? Now, one of the mistakes that early missionaries made was they concentrated, and they didn't have this teaching, I don't know. Um, they concentrated on the behaviors and the forms. So they wanted you to do certain things to look like a Christian, but it actually didn't change their worldview at all. So as you've probably heard, 80 to 85 percent of people in South Africa affiliate to Christianity. If that was actually so, I don't think we'd be having the problems that we have today here in South Africa. Sociologists say that as little as 2% of a population can change that population and that country. 2% fully committed individuals. So we haven't been changing people's worldview. We have just been thinking about their behaviors and their forms. So again, all cultures are designed to meet the needs, the insecurities of people, loneliness, alienation, purpose, whatever it might be. Cultures actually go to that. They, they answer those questions. And the gospel is saying that there is a God who came incarnationally to fulfill all the needs of our culture. Okay, And that's where we will go. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here because uh, I know that uh, I'm conscious of time for you. And I'm just wanting to say, in terms of what does all this mean? No one knows what the world is going to look like a year from now, right? And so I wanted to focus on principles and especially our mission as the church. Once we have our true north or our, what our ultimate plan of what we want to do, then we can figure out how to draw the map to get there or the architecture of the structure. But one thing I can say for sure, the church will always be here. I mean, I'm sure that you're familiar, you've heard of the underground church in China when um, 
Christian missionaries were, asked, were forced out of the country, and there was over 50 years of people didn't have any contact, and they thought um, Christianity just died. But when they went back in, after 50 years, there were 100 million uh, Christians, underground Christians, in secret. And there's something like 350 million now. So God's mission cannot be stopped. So that is one thing to keep in mind and, and be encouraged by. And I personally believe that there will always be a need for a church building to be seen in local communities. Because church buildings are a bridgehead into the world. They stand as a solid reminder that God's mission is still striving forward into enemy-occupied territory. Now, every kingdom breakthrough has come on the heels of a communication breakthrough. When the Roman roads were built, the gospel was able to spread to new regions. When Gutenberg invented the printing press, the Bible was able to be distributed far and wide. And now with the dawn of the digital age, what we are in, we are able to reach more people with the gospel than ever before. And the church has always used technology, right? They've made recordings, um, they've put their, their services on the TV, guitars, all. They, they, they might be reluctant, but they have been dragged into the current whatever century it is using technology. And now they're really having to learn how to use it. And here is the truth. Those who are doing the most they can during this time will reap the most rewards afterwards, okay? Depending on what is happening. And I do training on online uh, digital ministry throughout the province. And um, I can tell you, there are many people who, many priests and churches who don't do anything. And uh, I don't think it's good for them. So anyway... Now, there have actually been upticks in church attendance online in places like the UK. Right after they went to lockdown, fully a quarter of Britons went online to watch uh, a church service, which was percentages higher than anything the church had ever seen. So God is at work, but we need to be careful, though. We need to be figuring out how to turn this watching group into a community which eventually gets turned into being disciples, okay? Not just show watchers. I mean, if you ran a, a, a charity and you had 100 views a day on your promo video, but nobody gave any money to the charity, what's really being accomplished, right? So we need to work on moving people into community. The future is uncertain, and that is true. But having questions about how, how this is going to change the future and we want to we go back and, oh, I wish this, it's, it's too late. That, that horse has left the stable. I think that's the phrase. Um, but we need to be thinking about how we make better and form a greater community for our online presence. All right? And Jesus knows all about this and he is there in what we might be doing. So... Um, the rest of the church must understand the importance of the online church. And it needs to be clear that we value the online church too and what it is bringing to, um, to the world, to those who we don't normally reach, um, those who can somehow be a part of it. And um, it is key to have, have those, uh, those kinds of ideas about the online church. And... Um, I do have one big fear about us going online as much as we have, is that there are many who say religion should be private and personal, each to his own. And by having churches closed, this may fuel the thinking that this mystery, or what all these guys are doing, has now become complete. It's gone behind closed doors and should remain there. So I think there is a very real danger that we might lose the public square. I think we need to be very active as much as possible, even when there is lockdown. Because if we're not active, if we're not thinking about that, there might be people who say, ah, this has always been a club, now it's really a club. And they just go and they watch their own thing and they do their own thing. So we need to be very conscious in terms of the future church about how we 
think first of the Maseo Dei as we're moving forward, the mission of God. If you haven't read or thought about the mission of God, start in Genesis and go through the Bible and you'll see how he moves his mission forward and then how we are blinded by certain things in culture and need to address the gospel to the worldview and then being able to bring our online community, our online watchers and people into a greater community um, with the church and with each other. So I'm sorry if I went long. Thank you very much for your time and perhaps I'll see you back in this space.